Good morning, Wham! What's up? How you doing? Hi, right, it's Mr. Gator here. We're going doing an awesome lesson uh, all the next four days on Boston during the American Revolution. My like favorite thing in history to learn about when I was your age. I, I loved it. I read books on it. Still do. Does that make me look weird? Like crazy? Maybe. But I just want you, uh, I hope you enjoy it. And I, I want you to read and kind of learn some stuff. So uh, the first one we're going to deal with is the Boston Massacre. And I know it's chapter 13. And then we go to 11. Oh, that's, you know, again, uh, this book that we're reading, History of Us, Joy Hakem. You know, one of my favorite history books. She's great. But, eh, you know, some things confuse me about it. Like doing the Boston Tea Party before the massacre when, in fact, the massacre was first. So this is uh, about three years. No, it's not about. It's three years before the uh, Tea Party and five before the revolution starts is the Boston Massacre. So it was a slow build to the revolution. It just didn't happen right away. More and more people got more and more angry and started siding with the Patriots instead of the Tories or Loyalists that we talked about. Now, um, the massacre in Boston, it, it happened right near Faneuil Hall, up the hill. Uh, I, I, you can still go and see where it happened and things like that. So it, it's um, very local. You can go visit these places with just a short drive into Boston. Uh, the Freedom Trail in the summer is great. It's, uh, you probably can go and, without needing a museum. So even with COVID, it, it's a safe place to go learn about history. All right, so we're going to read Chapter 13, A Massacre in Boston. Samuel Adams had a young cousin named John. I've heard of one Mr. Adams, said King George to the Massachusetts governor. But who is the other? The other honest, serious John Adams would become even more famous than Sam. Sam was an agitator and, and an organizer who helped start a revolution. John was a farmer and a lawyer and a solid citizen who helped lead that revolution. Someone who knew John Adams said that he possessed more learning than anyone in the colonies. That may have been an exaggeration, but John had a done a lot of reading and studying, and he knew how to use his mind. Here's a story about both Adam's cousins, the story of the Boston Massacre. A massacre, as you may know, is a gruesome killing. That's what happened in Boston in 1770. The story begins in 1765, when the English Parliament passed a law that said American citizens had to provide quarters for British soldiers. The quarters they were talking about are not the kind you get when you add two dimes and a nickel. Quarters can also be houses where soldiers live. The law was called the Quartering Act. English soldiers, who were called redcoats because of the color of their uniforms, were to be quartered in American towns and cities. Well, the Americans didn't want British redcoats quartered in their towns or cities or even in their country. So when the soldiers arrived in 1768, the colonists weren't very kind to them. Sometimes they made fun of them. Sometimes they threw snowballs or rocks. Sometimes they called them lobster bags or worse names. The people in Boston were especially annoyed and, at first, wouldn't even provide quarters, so the soldiers set up tents on the Boston Common, a big grassy area in the center of town, and played their drums and bugles loudly at the most inappropriate times. They were poorly paid and many were homesick. Some ran away from the British Army. Soldiers who run away are called deserters. British deserters who were, were caught were shot. A few redcoats, especially the officers, were treated well. 
some married American women. But for most of the British soldiers, the winters in Boston seemed longer and colder and more miserable than any they had ever known. On a freezing March day in 1770, one of the king's soldiers was looking for work to earn some extra money. Someone started making fun of him and told him to get a job cleaning toilets. Only um, they didn't have the kind of toilets we have today. They had um, outhouses, uh, the outdoor privies, which were dirt-floored holes, and they smelled. One thing led to another, and there was a fight. And believe me, they didn't say, clean my privy. They probably said other words that were highly inappropriate. That started things. Soon, a noisy, jarring group of mischief-makers gathered in front of Boston Custom House. They began pushing and shoving and throwing stones and pieces of ice at the British sentry. He got knocked down and he called for help. Captain Thomas Preston came to the rescue with eight British soldiers. There was some confusion about what happened next. The mob is said to have taunted the redcoats yelling, Fire! Fire! Captain Preston is to have yelled, Hold your fire! Then a British soldier was hit with a big stick. He claimed to have heard the word fire, so he fired. His gun into the crowd. The street gang moved forward. The Redcoats panicked and fired at unarmed people. Five Americans died. Seven were wounded. Uh, also, what's not said in here is... Um, because there was a big commotion, they were starting to ring the bells. Uh, and that's how you know, let know, everyone know something was going on. And back then, that was also the signal for a fire, because there was no fire. Comp they didn't have uh, firemen. So everyone might also, it's reported, they also said, fire, there's a fire. So the, all the, that added to the fire baloney. <sighs> None of them was a hero. The victims were troublemakers who got worse than they deserved. The soldiers were professionals. The British Army was supposed to be the best in the world, who shouldn't have panicked. The whole thing shouldn't have happened. Sam Adams made the most of it. He called it the Boston Massacre and had Paul Revere, yes, that Paul Revere, engrave a picture of the scene. Revere was a silversmith who made fine teapots and pitchers. He was also a dedicated patriot, a dentist, a printer, a good horseback rider, and a friend of Samuel Adams. The picture that Paul Revere chose to etch into a piece of copper so it could be printed over and over again showed British soldiers firing at peaceful Boston citizens. That wasn't the way it actually happened. Adams and Revere knew that but the drawing made good propaganda. It made people furious at the British. That drawing was soon seen all over the colonies, and it helped start a war. There's a picture there. And if you notice, it's the front cover! Ah! There you go. There is one hero in the story of the Boston Massacre, John Adams. John didn't want British soldiers in Boston. He wanted freedom for his country, but he was fair and always did what he thought was right. And even though everyone in America wanted to blame the British soldiers, John Adams believed that they should have a fair trial. He knew they needed a good lawyer and he was one of the best lawyers in the colonies. So he took the case of the Redcoats. Adams argued that the soldiers had defended themselves against an angry mob. A Boston jury found six of the soldiers not guilty. Two soldiers were found guilty of manslaughter, not murder. They were branded on their thumbs. So manslaughter means you kill someone in a fight. You didn't plan to kill them, but then you got really angry and you killed them. 
That, they still have that today. That's called Murder 2. Um, it's called Manslaughter. Um, also, when, when John Adams uh, took on this case, uh, it was very unpopular. It was very risky for him to do. In the end, it helped him become the second president. Everyone really respected him for doing that. And so it's an interesting thing. It, it wasn't supposed to be good for him, but it was. Long after the American Revolution, someone asked John Adams what the war had been about. There were two revolutions, he explained. One was the war itself, but the important revolution, he said, had occurred even before the war began. It had to do with ideas and attitudes. The revolution was in the minds and hearts of the people, said John Adams. What do you think he meant by that? Hmm. John Adams was fighting for more than just separation from England. He wanted a chance to form a totally new kind of government, a government based on fair play and self-government. Are people able to govern themselves? That question wasn't even being asked in most of the world. Always there were kings or priests or a ruling class, a country where people made their own laws. That sounded strange. Could the mass of people be trusted to choose their own leaders? It, it was a radical idea. Samuel and John Adams knew that people in the colonies had much experience in self-government. They believed Americans could run their own nation and elect their own leaders. The Adam cousins would convince others they would help form an American republic. There was much to do before it could be all worked out. Plans had to be made. A Congress was needed. Samuel Adams' committee of correspondence were made up of leaders from all of the colonies. Those committees then became a Congress, the first Continental Congress. It was 1774 when the Congress met in Philadelphia, midway between New England and the southern colonies. Philadelphia was America's leading city, so it made sense to meet there. Representatives came from every colony except Georgia. Samuel Adams and John Adams were both delegates. Sam wore a new wine red suit with gold buttons, a gift from a Boston craftsman who didn't want his representative to look shabby. Alexander McDougall and John Jay, who would later be a new nation's first chief justice, came from New York, determined to see that the colonies put pressure on England by not importing her goods. John Dickinson, who lived in Philadelphia, argued that a way must be found to get along with England. South Carolina's Christopher Gadsden and Virginia's Patrick Henry didn't agree with Dickinson. They were considered radicals. Arms are a resource to which we shall be forced, said the fiery Patrick Henry. When he said arms, he meant guns. The Congress soon advised the colonists to form and arm militia units and to stop buying goods from England. Virginia's Peyton Randolph, a moderate, was elected president of the Congress South Carolina's John Rutledge, whom you first met when he visited New York for the Stamp Con Act Congress, was another moderate. There is in the Congress a collection of the greatest men upon this continent, John Adams noted in his diary. The delegates at the Congress passed 10 resolutions listing the rights of the colonists, including the right to life, liberty, and property. But perhaps the most important thing that happened was that the colonial leaders, leaders got together and talked about their common problems. And they wrote a polite, respectful petition and sent it to King George, urging him to consider their complaints. But George wouldn't even think about that. The delegates made plans to meet again if the situation in the country didn't improve. Things got worse. 
Oh, yes. They got worse. And we'll see about that tomorrow.